What's a museum? This is a question I've asked more than once in the new criterion. It's one this magazine has been asking since its first issue. And it's one that I wish museums would ask more frequently of themselves, because the answers are changing through assumptions that are often unacknowledged, unannounced, and unexplored. Writing nearly 20 years ago on the ongoing transformation of the American Museum, the late theorist Stephen E. Weil identified how museums were moving from being about something to being for somebody. This is a phrase that has been taken up by critics of contemporary museum culture, but for a while it signaled a positive change, a momentous redirection he traced back to the cultural revolts of the 1960s. The museum of the past, he said, was content to care for the old-fashioned satisfaction, aesthetic refreshment, and pleasure and delight of its permanent collection, or what the museum director Barbara Franco derided as the salvage and warehouse business. Through new evaluation standards tied to continued tax-exempt status, Weil argued, the museum of today is, quote, being told that to earn its keep requires that it be something more important than just an orderly warehouse. In other words, through historical inevitability and government coercion, Weil concluded, the museum of tomorrow must come to see itself not as the steward of a collection of objects, but as an instrument for social change. 20 years on, the prophecy is coming true but with increasingly ominous and destructive results, especially for collecting museums, which will be the subject of this presentation. In 1997, the Brazilian museum director, Maria de Lourdes Horta, envisioned how a museum without walls and without objects, a true virtual museum is being born, to be used in a new way as tools for self-expression, self-recognition, and representation. Or as Neil Benezra, the director of SF MoMA, more recently observed, Times have changed. Back then, a museum's fundamental role was about taking care of and protecting the art. But this century, it's much more about the visitor experience. Over the last few decades, the American Museum has only been too successful at turning this vision into reality. By the numbers, museums have become thriving enterprises, competing and ballooning into what we might call a museum industrial complex. Today, there are 3,500 art museums in the United States, more than half of them founded after 1970 and 17,000 museums of all types in total, including science museums, children's museums, and historical houses. Attendance at art museums is booming, rising from 22 million a year in 1962 to over 100 million in 2000. At the same time, and hand in hand with these numbers, billions of dollars have been spent on projects that have largely focused on expanding the social service offerings at these institutions, restaurants, auditoriums, educational divisions, event spaces, rather than additional rooms for collections. At the present rate, the Museum of the Future will virtually be a museum without objects, as new non-collection spaces dwarf exhibition halls, with the promise that no direct contact with the past will disturb your meal. Or as London's Victorian Albert Museum once advertised, the Museum of the Future will finally be a cafe with art on the side. The Museum of the Past focused on its permanent collection. The museum of the present forsakes the visited and its own cultural importance to focus on the visitor. From offering an unmediated window onto the real and astonishing objects of history, the contemporary museum increasingly looks to reify our own socially mediated self-reflections. This it does not to learn from history, but to show the superiority of our present time over past relics. The result is a museum that succeeds by every popular measure in its own destruction, a museum that is no longer an arc of culture, but one where the artifact at greatest risk is the museum itself. The American Art Museum was born in the 19th century, a generation later than its European counterparts, and largely as an answer to those institutions, but with a unique American quality tied to its permanent collection. Unlike in Europe, where museums were either created out of revolutionary turmoil or acts of government, almost all American institutions were founded and supported by the free will of private individuals. Mm -hmm. The treasures these benefactors bequeathed became not only public objects of secular devotion, but also tokens of the idealism behind the institutions that maintained them. As manifestations of private wealth transferred to the public trust, American museums were founded in part to represent our civic virtues. The aesthetic education offered through their permanent collections was not just about history and connoisseurship. It was also about how hard work can become an expression of virtue by gifting objects to the public trust. It's truly an astonishing American story. No other country has seen such private wealth 
accumulated through industry, willingly transfer to the public good. But it wasn't long into the 20th century before some American museums began to attack their own cellular structure, usually in the pursuit of progressive social change. These assaults were most manifest in the physical transformations and deformations of institutional buildings. Now, in many cases, it should be said that the change in appearance of our museums was benign. Rather than malignant tumors, they signaled healthy growth through evolving architectural styles. The dozen or so buildings that make up the Metropolitan Museum of Art have created a unified whole out of an assembly that ranged from Gothic revival to Beaux-Arts to modern. These diverse structures complement one another and work to complete the museum's founding vision. And here you can see the original 1880 uh, Gothic building designed by Vox and Mold, uh, which still exists but is now surrounded by later wings, fronted by Richard Morris Hunt's uh, 1902 Beaux-Arts Beaux -Arts Fifth Avenue facade. In contrast, consider the history of the Brooklyn Museum, born in 1823, nearly a half century before the Met, and a manifestation of rising civic confidence in a borough that was once America's third largest independent city. In the 1930s, a progressive director by the name of Philip uh, Yutz launched an assault on his 19th century museum, from which this great unfinished institution has never recovered. And we can see how much of the museum exists here versus the original plan. Believing that the museum of today must meet contemporary needs, quote unquote, Yutz attacked the museum's 1897 home designed by McKim Minid White on Eastern Parkway and vowed to, quote, turn a useless Renaissance palace into a serviceable modern museum. Praising the educational practices of the new Soviet museums, he undertook the transformation of the Brooklyn Museum from a temple of contemplation into a school of instruction, where the arts were put in the service of progressive ends and funding would derive from the state rather than private philanthropy. Yutz sought to transform his institution into a, quote, socially oriented museum with, as he stated, a collection of people surrounded by objects, not a collection of objects surrounded by people. He even hired department store window dressers to arrange exhibitions and transform his collection into a parade of teachable, teachable moments. <clears throat> Yutz then turned his programmatic assault into a physical one. Historians may question the ultimate motivation behind his demolition of the Brooklyn Museum's exterior grand staircase, picture here, which once resembled the entrance to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and was meant to elevate the museum goer from Eastern Parkway into the refined precincts of the museum. What is not in doubt is Yutz's belief that his iconoclasm, pushing the museum lobby down to street level, improved upon the McKimmon and White design Continuing in this way, Yutz went about mutilating much of the museum's ornamental interior. In this example, we can see that a progressive strain agitating for a more socially oriented museum long predates the 1960s. But since the 1960s, such progressive ideology, combined with what I would call a nonprofit profit motive that seeks even larger crowds, greater publicity, expanding spaces, ballooning budgets, and bloated bureaucracy, a circular system that feeds on itself, has turned the American Museum into a neoliberal juggernaut. The expansion plans that museums now seem to announce by the day may appear to be the evidence of healthy organic growth, but their motivations are just as often closer in ideology to the removal of the Brooklyn Museum's grand staircase, efforts at distancing the present from the past. There are many examples. The 70,000 square foot, $114 million new wing of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum which opened in 2012, is but one. Designed by Renzo Piano, the building, which acquired the demolition of Gardner's historic carriage house, now serves as the only entrance to the institution and connects with the original museum through a glass-enclosed airlock. The addition offers a Kunsthof for new art, eateries, shops, a greenhouse, a visitor, quote, living room, and apartments. All are attractive, but for what end? A greenhouse to cultivate new interests? A $100 million engine to generate new donors? even as streaks of rust still stain the museum courtyard? I would argue that the expansion primarily serves to quarantine the original museum's antiquity behind an architectural filtration system. With the anointment of Renzo's oil, the museum shifts its focus from what is left of its collection onto the visitor experience. As the gardener's director explained to me at the time of the opening, finally those people in their cars on Fenway Park Drive will recognize the gardener as a museum because here is Renzo Piano. Never mind 
that the Gardner's fanciful palazzo has been a signature of the Boston street streetscape since 1903. Back in New York, the Whitney, a museum with a vastly different history, relocated in 2015 from the Upper East Side to a flood zone along the Hudson River with results that are surprisingly similar to the Gardner's. We have heard the modern museum referred to as a white box, designed again by Renzo Piano. Here is the museum as Skybox, an institution built as much to be looked out of as looked into, a place where CNBC has moved from the periphery to the main event. As opposed to the Whitney's former Fortress of Solitude on Madison Avenue, designed by Marcel Breuer in 1966, the new museum metaphorically explodes, reprocesses, and repackages its own history through a giddy, irrational space for spectacle and an incinerator for its dusty, unwanted past. This may be one reason why the institution has be re been rechristened as simply Whitney, dropping the words museum, American, and art from its branding. <laughs> Yet while Piano increased the Whitney's floor plan from 85,000 to 220,000 square feet, just 50,000 of that is going to interior galleries, up from 33,000 on Madison Avenue. The rest? goes to multi-million dollar views and a circulation system that forces the museum goer outside onto a fire escape turned against the skyline, which like Piano's Pompidou, treats the museum as an institutional theater. Do all of these changes and initiatives really turn museums into instruments of social change? Do they merely justify bigger budgets and higher ticket prices? I would argue that by mediating our experience, through ever more gauzy filters, they in fact blunt the true radicalism of our direct encounter with the objects of history. Rather than decentering us at a radical moment of unselfing, as the director James Cuno once observed, today's institutions promote Museum Selfie Day and roll out every trick at recentering the experience of the museum around you. What better way, after all, to reap the benefits of hashtag advertising while entertaining the egocentrism of your turnstile clientele? But why not? What's so wrong about the Metropolitan Museum of Art's recent promotion of nail art sessions by Lady Fancy Nails as it did around the show Manus Ex Machina? Or what about a promotion by the Art Institute of Chicago that offered a full-size replica of Van Gogh's painting The Bedroom available for nightly rental on Airbnb? Or how about this year's Met Workout, a museum-sponsored event that advertised Goodbye Soul Cycle, Hello Vermeer and Picasso. You thought just trying to stroll through the Met collection was a workout. Try doing stretches in the shadow of Diana or squats while pondering the shapely poise of John Singer Sargent's Madame X. This season, the Guggenheim Museum installed a working gold toilet designed by the neo Dadaist Maurizio Catalan in one of its bathrooms. The facility, which requires a special guard and janitor, seen here, attracts hour-long lines that snake up the rotunda. And this is a photo I just took the other day. This interactive Duchampian sculpture, the most shared golden toilet on the internet, is called America, how original, but it might just as well be titled The Museum. The provocation is presented as an inside joke, but it ultimately degrades the institution itself for one more social media share. A golden toilet is an appropriate symbol for the museum fully dedicated to the visitor experience. Perhaps we should suggest a golden toilet award for social engagement. <laughs> the problem is that such promotions, by converting the museum from a temple of culture into a cathedral of the self, spend down its reserves of virtue. The Instagram age has little need for venues for self-expression, self-recognition, and representation. Our times yearn for a real unmediated engagement with the objects of the past that only a traditional collection-based museum can offer. This may be one reason why we saw widespread uproar over the recent rebranding of the Metropolitan Museum. It wasn't so much over its lackluster typography and its spendthrift rollout at a time of operational shortfalls. It was that so many people deeply admired what the museum's traditional brand had come to represent. <laughs> and someone mocked it up as the meh. There are many counterexamples to this story. You will hear several today of museums that resist progressive currents and reaffirm their original collection mandates. Increasingly, I draw encouragement not from too big to fail institutions, but from those tributaries and backwaters of our museum mainstream, 
from today's Hispanic society, for example, preserved in amber on 155th Street and Broadway, to house museums like the Moore's Jumel Mansion in Washington Heights, where Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, wrote parts of Hamilton while sitting in Aaron Burr's bedroom. Museum trustees still have the power to redirect the resources away from artless atriums and administrative bloat to true collection access through initiatives such as the Visible Storage Centers sponsored by Henry R. Luce. But I suspect we have only seen the tip of a proverbial iceberg now in the path of the museum at full steam. Museums may assume that new buildings and hashtag diplomacy will insulate them from the most destructive progressive mandates, but these are just openings for a new generation of cultural leaders contemptuous of the permanent collections of robber barons to undermine their stewardship. Already, ill-adventuring museum directors such as Thomas Hoving has showed us what could be done through deaccessioning when, in the early 1970s, he began liquidating bequests over the objections of his curators to enhance his own discretionary spending. Now look for a further loosening of deaccession standards. For a generation, museums have chased after the numbers with blockbuster exhibitions and amenities that have indirectly ceded curatorial control to the turnstile. The government now looks to accelerate this abdication of leadership through re-envisioning our grant programs as the National Endowment for the Humanities announced this year. If the museum visitor now expects to receive the keys to the collection backed by government mandates, there may be little hope to save the museum from populist whim. Earlier this month, an activist group called Decolonize This Place continued its targeting of museums by storming the rotunda of the American Museum of Natural History. Chanting respect, remove, rename, they then covered the equestrian statue of Theodore Roosevelt and demanded that, quote, city council members vote to remove this monument to racial conquest. At one time, this might have seemed like an extreme suggestion, but given the current iconoclasm on university campuses, the protesters know they are part of a populist insurgency. This is the end result of the Museum for Somebody, a museum without objects that is ultimately objectless, a museum for nobody. Thank you.